Lovely, wonderful to see everyone, and uh, it's lovely to hear the flurry of fellowship and conversation. A few faces that we haven't seen for a while, and we have got uh, some prayer points for people that are absent today. Martin has uh, engaged and started in a new job at the moment, yeah, so he uh, can't be with us for that reason. Um, Irene has uh, said that herself and Margaret can't be here today, and of course Janice is still uh, recovering. <laughs> oh, so an appointment today. So it's something routine, but she's doing very well. So uh, keep Janice in your prayers, Irene, Martin, and uh, anyone else, and we'll be praying for them shortly. But we're going to open the service now in prayer, and then move straight to Scripture. Um, Dawn, could I ask you all open the service in prayer, please? Thank you. Shall we pray? Father God, it's so good to be in your house once again. We thank you, Father God, because you love us and you understand us. And Lord, you think of all our um, church family who usually come this afternoon. Lord, we pray that wherever they are and whatever they are doing, that you will be unto them all that they need right at this moment in time. We thank you for each brother and each sister. And we just leave them in your care, Lord. Lord, we know that we are here because we want to be here. And so, Lord, as we wait upon you just now, we pray indeed that you will come to us afresh. We thank you, because you are our friend and our saviour. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We will need hymn books, so I'll uh, hand those to people to uh, just pass back um, accordingly. And then we're going to move straight into Scripture. Thank you, uh, Sam Little. Um, if you've got your Bibles with you, we're going to turn to... Um, Psalm 133, but before we do, as we're turning to it, I'm going to give the notices for the week. So, it's Wednesday, later this evening, we've got the Bible study, 6 till 7, and at the moment we're seeing a little flurry of youth in particular, the ones and twos, looking to further uh, their knowledge of Jesus. And we're looking towards a youth alpha in the new year and the possibility of baptisms. I've had a lovely conversation with um, one of our friends up the road who opens up his baptistry in the church and he's very keen to uh, engage in delivering that youth alpha. So that looks like that's taking place. So we'll see what uh, God does with that. And each of the young people that have come in in particular are talking about bringing friends. They're connecting with people in their schools. So God is doing something. Uh, so keep that in prayer. But tonight, adults next door, youth in here, and we'll see what God wants to do with that. Then Thursday, we've got the Worship Academy and Community Choir. Oh, that's a lovely little nod of excitement. That's what I like to see. And, of course, we're practising again for the carol concert on Sunday afternoon. And it was such a privilege. Uh, Sunday afternoon, we were in Arrow Valley Country Park, and we had the um, Worship Academy Band with the Salvation Army Brass Band, um, and the fusion of those two was something really remarkable. So if you weren't there, you missed something special. It was the first time that we did it on the 3rd. We're looking to do it on the 10th which I'll talk about in a moment, and then also in the 17th. So, big plans for the fusion of those worship bands, which I'm going to talk about more in a second with our scripture. Then on Friday, we've got the luncheon. Um, do come, I'm cooking, so uh, don't let that put you off. Um, I'm uh, facilitating the uh, meal going out on Friday afternoon, so do come. No one's died yet from my cooking, but I do say yet, and um, there's always a first, and uh, it's always a good meal, gospel message, and, you know, sandwiched in prayer. That's what we want. We want to see as many people as possible. Then, 2.30 to 4.30, we've got the recovery cafe, and in the new year, there's going to be an employment um, wing bolted onto that. So not only can we help signpost, 
and lead people away from addictions and support them in that. Uh, it's also a safe place to just come for a cuppa, but there's going to be employment support as well. So loads of wings to what's going on. Then this Saturday we're out in the highways and byways, we're distributing the Word of God and invitations into all the things that God is doing. Then Sunday, as mentioned, we've got our morning services, we've got our uh, Arrow Valley concert, carol concert, in the Boat House in collaboration with the Council. So we're expecting to see thousands, standing room only. But we'll see. It wasn't thousands last week. So uh, it was a warm up and we expect to see more. And then we're back here for Sunday evening gospel service. And last week, I should report as well, we had the combined churches together service at the Baptist church and that was spectacular. Not just because there's Baptists here today that hosted <laughs> us, but it, uh, it was, it was good. It was a good time of fellowship, unity, partnership, and really sort of showcase all of what God is doing here in tandem and partnership with such a closely aligned church as Redditch Baptist Church. And it was really quite a special time of fellowship. It was good. <laughs> So uh, you missed the trick, you missed the treat if you weren't there. But scripture now, as we turn into uh, Psalm 133, talks about that unity and that partnership which we're seeing. God is doing something remarkable and wonderful within our midst. And we're going to read it now. Three verses, so maybe a verse each as we read around. Sorry, what was it? How good, Psalm 133, sorry, 133. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. Verse 2. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermia were falling on their toil. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even Lord, forevermore. Praise God. And for those that were looking and thinking, that's unfamiliar to me. I'm not quite sure I've read that one. We'll read it again. Go on. Three, three people. Someone start off with verse one and we'll move around. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Can we read it again? We can do, yeah, please do. Take it round again, please. Yeah, if you'd like the BBC, repeat, sir. <laughs> Someone starts us off with verse one then and we'll go round again. It is that precious oil uh, poured on on the head, running down on the on the field, running down on um, the name. Oh, oh, sorry. Read verse one. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm reading it wrong. No, no worries. Yes. Um, is it, it is when God's people live together in unity. Sorry, Joe. No, no problem. Thank you, first day. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. First three. It is as if the Jew of were falling on Mount Zion. For the Lord bestows his blessing. For there the Lord bestows his blessing. Even life forever. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. Now looking around, look around at the motley crew that God sent today. Precisely. <laughs> um, I reckon there's about eight churches represented here, just dotting around. Eight churches, maybe seven or eight, in unity, in partnership. Now, 
We had a great time on Sunday evening, as I said. But the one thing that was lacking was a number of churches in that partnership and unity. There was a distinct absence of certain churches that formed 19 churches, I believe, in the Redditch Churches Together um, community group. Yeah, thank you. Uh, fellowship. Uh, but uh, to have seven or eight churches represented here today, marvellous, wonderful. Uh, we've just got to pray that we each of us encourage and teach more of our congregation to attend. I know what you're thinking. If you've been to my church, there's only me there. So, uh, uh, so I can't encourage many more. Maybe my shadow. But, uh, but it's good, isn't it? Seven or eight churches. And we should be inviting other members of those churches into what God is doing. Praise God. Now, we're going to pray later for our worship team that are absent today. So uh, we're going to have to put up with uh, leading worship a cappella style. But we're now going to stand and sing number 49, How Great Thou Art, as we come to praise and worship God. Number 49. And I, I don't pick the easy ones, do I, when I'm on my own? Here we go. Let us stand and sing number 49. <laughs> oh Lord my God, am I in awesome wonder? Consider all the works thy hands have made. I see the Oh, 
uh, and giving them a pen. But no, uh, it's lovely that we share that sentiment. The sentiment is true. Bless you. But, uh, yeah, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's my motto. Um, I want to share something with you. Yeah, if it is broke, absolutely. But what a him, what a him. But bless you. Um, Fiona's at the back. I'm going to call her out and I'm going to embarrass her. Myself and Fiona was having a conversation, I think probably about a year ago, maybe 18 months ago, about reaching all of Redditch for Christ with the Gospel. And at the time, we were sitting down and we were thinking about the distribution of the Good News newspaper into every home. The possibility of a New Testament of Psalms into every home. Well, that's evolved slightly. We look like um, it's a project that I'm uh, currently praying into. It looks like we're going to produce 100,000 John's Gospels with a bespoke cover linked to Redditch. Uh, not that we need to make the Gospel palatable. But it'll be a keepsake that people can uh, keep and cherish and love for Redditch. Uh, so we're getting a local artist, we're going to have a conversation of producing a bespoke cover, um, showcasing all the things of Redditch. And then that is going to go into the homes of every single person. So 100,000 Gospels is quite tricky. We're going to need all hands on deck. So anyone who loves the Lord, professes the Lord and lives for the Lord uh, will be able to partner in that distribution of God's Word. And we're expecting huge things to come from that. When you're scattering seed into the homes of 100,000 people, what's God going to do with that? What's the increase and what's the multiplication? So I really believe 2024, 2025 in particular, are going to be big years of, uh, well, reaping, sowing, but also harvest. Yeah, because, you know, that's not me standing up here and pretending I'm sowing I'm not. You know, God hasn't necessarily told me that's going to happen, but God's Word has. Yeah. God's Word has distinctly so said that as we sow, we will see the uh, uh, fruits, we will see the harvest. So all we're doing is plodding the ground prayerfully and sowing. God's going to send the increase. I'm not saying that he's told me the increase, but God will, his word says. So um, be expectant, but things do continue evolving. So although we haven't necessarily had fellowship with Fiona over the last 12, 18 months per se, um, you know, that conversation is still in God's hands and it's moving forward. So exciting things happening. Also, I'd like to give out an invitation um, on the 20th of January, Saturday the 20th of January, we're going to have a gospel uh, service here and we're going to invite everyone, anyone who needs to know the Lord, every saint, come, bring your family, your friends and it's going to be a bring and share and we're going to have a, a bit of fellowship unlike any other. So do come if you're able. God's moving. Be part of it. Um, Alan and um, Becca saw me at the start of the service and they said, who's preaching today? And they yeah, said, are I know. you? Yeah. And I said, I know. no, no, it's not me today. I said, it's David. They went, <laughs> oh, we've got to leave. <laughs> uh, but no, they had a prior engagement. No, I so they, I knew that, yeah, they sent apologies. I said, <laughs> I said, David's used to people walking out halfway through the door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or but uh, or with, with that in mind, David's going to come and share the word of God with us. And uh, let us pray for him. Dear Lord, we just pray now for David. We thank you that he's your mouthpiece. We just pray that you will speak so clearly through him that we will be touched and our hearts, minds and souls will be changed with the things that you are speaking through to us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, Dad, nobody asked you because they'd all have gone. <laughs> well, it's getting closer, isn't it? Days are going along soon, soon, very, very soon. The big day will be here. Hallelujah. 
And then, I'm not talking about Christmas, I'm talking about when I go to Scotland next week. <laughs> in case you want Amen. to. Or even, or even a certain birthday on the 20th of January, is it, Joe? Possibly, yeah. Okay, that might be a lot. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, I'm having this film today because there's a reason I'll tell you if you want to have to begin. Uh, I'll get to you in Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 1. It's not yet Christmas. No. It's what you call Advent. Now, they didn't know what the word meant. They've got an idea what it meant. But some churches have uh, what you call um, different events and different things coming up to Christmas. I'm just going to read a few verses. Verse 18. Matthew 1. Now, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. And before they came together, she found to be with child for the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her widely. Huh? 118, Matthew 1. Oh, sorry, Matthew 1, 18, sorry. But yes, I should have said. I'm going to read on into chapter 2 as well, that's why I've put some here. But after they concluded, uh, consider this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. It's a nice thought, isn't it? Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Hallelujah! <laughs> okay, I'll carry on. All this took place to fulfil what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, took Mary home as his wife, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and gave him the name of Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem, and that's where is the one who had been born king of the Jews. We saw his star in the east and had come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. Not surprising. And all Jerusalem with him. We now called together all the people, the chief priests and teachers of the law. He asked him where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be shepherd of my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you found him, report him to to report to me so that I may go and worship him also. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that had been seen in the east went ahead of them until he stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him, giving him gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to come back to Herod, they returned to their country another route. Right. Familiar, isn't it? Familiar. Actually, when you think about it, we could preach it over and over again, not just in the so-called Christmas time. We'll get a drink, excuse me a minute. Right. I wonder if you've booked what you want for Christmas. I want mine to be a sports one. Four wheels, <laughs> turbo drive, <laughs> blue. No, I don't really need a car. But seriously, the world today is heading to oblivion. Mm. We see it around about us. And if you could get all the people together, who know the Christmas story, know the Christmas story, but have actually experienced what it means, there's very few. I went into, I went into, I went into a shop today, I went into Heinz, you know, the jewellers. I went in singing, I said, oh, you're happy. I said, yeah, I'm happy. I said, I'm always happy. 
And I said, uh, I've just come to see what sort of watch you got. I said, I'm not buying one in the moment, because I bought one not long ago. I said, but nice young lady, her name is Kim. And I said to her, do you know why I'm happy? And she said, why? Because she said, did she, is it the time? And I said, that's part of it. I said, but I'm a minister. And she said, what's a minister? <laughs> I could have said a, a member of parliament. But I said, I'm a preacher. I'm a pastor. I'm a priest, a vicar, whatever you want to call it. But that's what I am. And she said, I don't believe you. <laughs> so I showed her my, you know, driving licence, whatever. And she said, oh, so you are. I said, but I do love this time of year. It's also the time for pantomimes, isn't it? A little bit of pantomimes. <laughs> Who's never been to see a pantomime? Anyone never been to see a pantomime? I'm sure most of you have. Oh, no, you have. And we know that in the pantomime, there's always a goodie and there's a villain. Not right? Mm -hmm. A goodie and a villain. And they say that the villain is far better enjoyment to play. I don't get that, but that's what they say. Well, we're going to hear about a villain today who's probably the worst villain the world has ever heard. His name is Herod. Herod can be called the man who didn't want a rival. He didn't want a rival. He was a despot. He was a conspirator. He was vile. He was evil. He was vicious. And he was violent. And that was only on Sundays. He was a horrible man every day of the week and every hour of the day. So when the Magi, can I just say something? Nowhere in the Bible will you see three wise men. No. Nowhere in the Bible will you find the word stable even relating to the Christmas story. Did you know that? Yeah. No, good, no stable mentioned in the Bible. No wise men mentioned in the Bible. Not three wise men. Magi. That's what I call it. But when the Magi came, they came to what they thought was the right place because they came to the palace in Jerusalem, which is natural. They've been guided by the star. They knew something amazing was happening. They even believed themselves that a king was being born and something stupendous and supernatural was taking place. And they came right to the very place where a king should have been born. You see, although Herod was a nasty man and he was vile and he was vicious, he was also a puppet of Rome. They pulled the strings and he danced. When they said jump, he'd ask how high. He was really in their control, but he was there as a sort of, uh, if you like, he was a despot and he was a vile man and he was ruling over Israel and Jerusalem at that time. But he was terrified at the thought of a usurper taking over. He had no idea what was going on, but when the Magi came to the palace and they told him, they said, where did he see that he's born King of the Jews? Because we've seen his star in the east. Praise God for the sign in the skies that Jesus was coming. We need to keep our eyes on for the second coming as well, incidentally, keep our eyes looking on. But he was afraid. Now there are a lot of people today who talk about Christmas, and they'll spend thousands of pounds. And I talk to a lot of people in the town, and I say, ah, oh, but we've lost the meaning of it. I say that, oh, we've lost the meaning of it. Uh, there was a lady I know last week, her husband's a good friend of mine, and we was outside St Stephen's, and she saw the bars, and she saw all the nativity in there, and she said, wouldn't it be nice if we got a nice spotlight shining down on it? She's, and she's not a Christian, she said, because that's really what Christmas is all about. And I said, you're dead right, that's what Christmas is about. About the birth of the Saviour. And people say, yeah, we, we'd like to go out and celebrate. We'd like to have plenty to eat. We'd like to enjoy ourselves. But don't give us religion. Don't give us Jesus. Don't talk about Christianity. Don't call it a holiday. It is not a holiday. It's the birth of Jesus that we celebrate. And people can say, well, I like about holidays. You can have a holiday in the middle of July. It's Christmas that we celebrate the birth of the Saviour. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Oh, well, one person did. Never mind, we'll carry on. I'm too old. <laughs> now, when Herod heard that a child or a king was going to be born, he called for the, uh, the leaders, the, the preachers and the teachers of the law and the, the history, even as far back as the Bible or the Old Testament. And he said, where's he going to be born? 
When's he going to be born? And they knew. See, even the religious people in those days knew, but Herod was absolutely terrified. And so they said, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And they quoted him, said, for there Bethlehem, though you be the least amongst the children of Israel, to you shall become a ruler, and so on, which is found in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. So prophecy was being fulfilled. I want to say something very important today. Prophecy is being filled every single day of our lives. Particularly in these days. Prophecy is being fulfilled. And how we react to that may well depend on where we are with God and how we stand with God. They came to the palace. The priest knew exactly. The priest in the, he says in Isaiah 7 verse 13, he talks about a virgin shall be, not, not a virgin, the virgin shall be with child. Very important we don't just say I, not just any young woman, it was the Virgin Mary who was chosen by God to bring the baby Jesus into the world. Okay? She was a young woman, very young. Quite a significant difference between her and probably Joseph's age because he had to, would have had to have been a, a qualified uh, a tra craftsman, probably in his, his forces or something, to even be recognised. But Helen was disturbed, filled with anxiety. He'd had a good lifestyle, but I'd lived in the palace. He was very cruel, kept on pushing up the taxes. Anybody who stood in his way, he put him to death or had him thrown into prison. But he saw a threat to his reign. He saw a threat to his position. He was wealthy. He had a reputation. He had a rule that was under threat. He saw that his rule was under threat. He was a sadistic, cruel king. And in fact, one of the possibly the worst kings that Certainly Israel had had for a long time. He carried out acts of genocide. He carried out, later on we know, he also carried out acts of uh, multiple infants, infants, infanticide. infanticide. But the wise men, or the main, I'm not saying wise men, because that's probably what most people understand, they followed the star. Something had shown in their hearts, in their lives, in their land, something was taking place. Herod thought he was the star. Funny, isn't it? So many people say, I think they're the star. They're the celebrity. I don't think I've seen that problem. Get me a celebrity out of here. That's my life. What's it called? Is that right? Get me a celebrity out of here. Yeah. Pardon? I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, sorry. No. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm a celebrity. <laughs> In myself. <laughs> so many people say, 15 minutes of a fame. They, they think that they are somebody special. Herod had been the king, and he wanted to be the king, and he felt that his comfortable position, he felt that his status quo was being threatened by the birth of a usurper. And he tells him, go and look for this child that is being born, and bring me news that I might also go and worship him. What a deceiver, what a liar. What a fraud. He didn't want to worship him. He wanted to kill him. I often say that maybe as Christians even sometimes you get so carried away with all that's going on. So much all the, the trappings of, yeah, I'll put a Christmas tree. I'll put a Christmas tree in my house. I'll put some lights up. But all the rest of it, you know, it's, it's not important. What really matters, you might have nothing, but what really matters is that God sent Jesus Christ into the world to save the world, a born as a child, yes, grew as a man, and became our saviour and our redeemer, and the only way that will ever come to God, and people don't understand it, but he thought he was a star. So they come, they go, and they look for this king, this child that's being born. Maybe we'd be better sometimes if we didn't sing I'll come let us adore him. Because actually the way we behave and the way the world behaves would be more truthful if they said, Oh come let us ignore him. Because sometimes that's what they do. Even Christians. Get about the real meaning, the real purpose behind the coming of the Saviour. They didn't come to a stable. They came to a house. And the one they came to see wasn't a baby, it was probably nearly two years of age. Because if you read it carefully, they came to the house and they saw the child of his mother and they bowed down and worshipped him. They didn't worship Mary, they didn't worship anybody else. The centre of their worship, as it should be for us today, was Jesus. Jesus. 
It's a sense of our worship. Yeah, Lord. Means pies. I like Christmas pudding. I like turkey. I just like food, basically. <laughs> Christmas time is even better. <laughs> Helen says, go and find him that I might come and worship. What a lie. For the people today who are following all sorts of things that they can worship. They don't even realise it, but they do. They didn't come to a stable, came to see a child who was probably nearly two years old. That's why later on we see that Helen has the children, boys under two years of age, put to death. Felt threatened. How many people here today feel threatened by Christmas? Are you rushing about thinking, well, they've asked me to get them this, they've asked me to get them that? Forget it. Doesn't matter if you haven't got anything really special just to celebrate the birth of the Saviour. Just to celebrate the fact that Jesus came. And we know why he came. We've read it. He came to save his people from their sins. And he's not just a person who's come to be a saviour. He's actually Emmanuel, which means God with us. Not a bit of God with us, but God with us and our saviour. God finding a way to redeem mankind to himself. Have you got a rival? Have you got a rival? Have you got somebody who who you think more of than you do of Jesus? Have you got somebody who takes your adoration and your devotion more than Christ? You see, Helen was just a liar. It was full of fear, full of, uh, of, of absolute, uh, I always thought adversity, but certainly grief. Uh, and, uh, and he was afraid that the whole of his kingdom would be taken from him. But what he didn't realise is that Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. That's what Jesus said. He said, my kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And the kingdom of God isn't of this world. But we have to come to the place where we recognise that the very centre of Christmas isn't the stable, because it doesn't say the stable. It isn't even the major, it isn't the shepherds, it's not the angels, and they're all, all part of the Christmas story, they're all part of the coming of the, of the Lord to Bethlehem, but the actual centre of our worship, of our purpose in Christmas, is the Christ, Jesus, the Saviour of the world. That's why he came to save his people from their sins. Christ's birth divides opinion. Still does. And it will. There was a, I won't mention the religion, but in Luton, someone put a great big placard up a few years ago and it says Christmas is a sin. Well, it might be a sin to them, but to us, Christmas to us is, means a salvation. It should be. Christmas is never the sin. It was God's purpose and God's plan that we should know the Lord Jesus Christ, that we should bear before him. And notice what they, they came and they worshipped him. They opened their gifts. And I love the song I heard somebody sing a couple of years ago. What shall I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I'll bring the lamb. If I were a wise man or a member of the mage, I would do my part. What shall I give him? What is it? Say it. Our worship, our devotion, our love, our affection. We can't go back to the manger. But we look for the coming of the Lord. It's a thrill. It's a joy. We should never lose the wonderful sense of Jesus coming into the world. Why did he come? To say. So whatever else is happening around about you, no matter what else might take place, however you may feel, whatever might go on, and maybe when you, you've, you've got the same... Uh, a uh, bottle of aftershave that you've had for the last six years, or the uh, same pair of socks that granddad used to buy you, and now uh, your mum buys you. It doesn't matter. What matters is that in your heart you can know salvation. In your heart you can know the Prince of Peace. In your heart you can know the one who is born, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, whose kingdom shall know no end. Government will go on increasing and grow it. Christ is not a rival. Helen thought he was. And yet some people do have rivals. There are things that hinder them in their walk. There are things that 
get in the way of them really enjoying because they've got divided minds and they don't quite know what to do or how to react to certain things. But when we concentrate, when we become single-minded and realise that the baby in Bethlehem that was in the manger is our saviour. That's what Christmas is about. That's why we praise. That's why we rejoice. That's why we come and worship. There's no rival. He has no rival. That's what the song says. He has no equal. But we need to worship. We need to adore. We need to put him first. And I can understand a little bit about Herod being so afraid in case he lost his kingdom and, and his comfortable life and all the people who had to pay their taxes to him. But actually, he should have known. Jesus wasn't going to take his world and kingdom. He was coming to set up a way for all of us to come to God. He didn't want a rival. Have you got a rival? I hope not, because Jesus wants to be first in our worship and our adoration. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget it. I know it's not Christmas yet. We might never get there. But worship the Lord with all you've got. Amen. And with that in mind, we are going to worship the Lord with all that we've got. We're going to stand and sing. Blessed assurance, 455. That blessed assurance that Jesus is mine, Jesus is thine. And um, let us sing of that salvation, that purchase of God, born of his spirit and washed in his blood. Let us stand and sing. 455, blessed assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Hair of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of Oh, 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 oh,